What is the mission of the Defense Commissary Agency, DECA? How has the pandemic impacted its operation? And how is the Defense Commissary Agency changing the way it does business? I'll explore these questions and so much more with our very special guest, Bill Moore, Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Defense Commissary Agency. So, you know, for our audience, Bill, I'd like to get some context. Would you tell us more about the history and mission of the Defense Commissary Agency? How has it evolved since its inception? Yeah, actually, the Defense Commissary Agency started in October of 1991, so we're actually in our 30th year. But the commissary system goes really all the way back to the revolutionary times of our country. And uh, in 1825, it was institutionalized for officers only. And then in 1867, just after the Civil War, it became uh, open to all enlisted and officers. So that's what we call now the modern era of the commissaries. Started in 1867, and, and then we combined all the services commissaries together in 1991 with the inception of the Defense Commissary Agency. Just a good benefit. I mean, so you mentioned five months in, in your role. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your duties and responsibilities as the director and CEO of, of it. It's called a DECA, right? DECA is, yeah. Basically, I am responsible to deliver that benefit by law to our all eligible patrons. And uh, so the 23.7 is kind of like job one. Everywhere I go, I talk to the importance of delivering the benefit. Uh, but as part of that, I'm, f- I'm fiscally responsible for our budget. I'm responsible for our auditability, for the fact that uh, we treat our customers well, you know, the whole dignity and respect uh, requirement and how we treat our each other and our customers, nearly 14,000 employees. So I'm personally accountable uh, in, in my head to each one of the, our employees. You know, I like to lift them up uh, rather than being kind of the guy on the top looking down. And uh, and I see my role as enabling our employees to deliver the benefits. So that's, that's kind of how I see it, uh, sort of a servant leader type perspective from where I was raised as a leader. Uh, and, and you know, have a great staff that supports me in, in doing that. We have a fairly robust headquarters, I think six or 700 people all together. And, uh, and we do the buying from that level. So we work with industry. I view part of my responsibility is dealing with industry. And I, I think we'll talk to that a little bit later. And then coming back to the stores, making sure our stores are really upholding our standards in terms of cleanliness, modernization, and, uh, and right product selection, which is a big deal with our, with our customers. I know it's only been five months, as you said, and you kind of are in the mix of a, a situation that's been unusual for everyone, being in the pandemic, and still, that's still involved in it, too, and still dealing with it. But, but Bill, if you, could, if you could think about it, what has surprised you most since taking on your role? Um, wow, that's a great question. Uh, first and foremost is the... Um, is the workforce. I was cautioned when I was initially hired that the workforce might be kind of in a status quo mode, and, and it wasn't like that at all. I mean, from from my deputy director down, everyone is all in on the, the value of the benefit. We are all believers. You, you know, I, I like to talk purposeful work. We have a great purpose in delivering this benefit. And every time I see a family walking into a commissary, you know, I feel proud that I'm involved in that. Uh, I was a military brat, army brat specifically. My dad was a retired uh, and disabled vet uh, who fought in Korea and Vietnam as a a non-commissioned officer with the army. And so I got, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom, so I was dragged to the commissary, me and my sister, throughout my childhood. So I've seen it from that end. And uh, and then in my Army job, before I came into this position, I was uh, working inside the Pentagon as part of the Department of the Army staff. And one of my responsibilities was representing my boss on the Defense Commissary Agency Board of Directors. So, uh, so I got to kind of see it from the top and from the bottom. And, uh, and so that was really helpful in, in how we, you know, work to deliver the benefit. But the workforce, you know, they are incredible. They are knowledgeable. It's unbelievable the tenure of our workforce. Uh, most of our work, uh, uh, even at the headquarters level, started out as a bagger or a checkout clerk as a GS2 or 3 and have worked their way up through the commissary agency. So a lot of depth there. And a lot of commitment on uh, on doing the things we need to do to transform the agency and, and provide and deliver on the benefit. Let me add one other aspect of what surprised me most in taking the job. I mean, the workforce has been awesome, but uh, but the other 
aspect that surprised me was the um, our young service members not enjoying the benefit of the commissary. There's a perception, for one, that it's just not cool. Uh, we have a lot of retirees and we have a lot of senior military inside the commissary. And uh, and so they they fear going there. So they don't enjoy their benefit like they should. And the second aspect, this generation, like it or not, convenience matters to this generation. Their time is so important to them. They will choose time over value, as, as I see it. And uh, so they'll trade that quarter off per dollar of savings if it saves them time by going elsewhere or shopping outside the gate or avoiding those senior leaders. And, uh, and so one of the things we've got to do is find a way to make it cool and convenient for young service members, maybe even delivery as an example to the barracks yeah. uh, as a way to get them to enjoy their benefit. They, they've earned that right to save, and I want to deliver on it. So that was just another surprising aspect to me, and, and we've got to work, work on that. So, uh, Bill, would you outline for us the strategic vision and key priorities for realizing that vision for the Defense Commissary Agency. What is it? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mentioned earlier, I did the 100-day assessment, and I had to do that a little bit blind in this COVID environment. I wasn't able to visit as many commissaries uh, as I would have liked, and I didn't get overseas like I would have liked since we have over 25% of our stores are in our overseas locations as well as some distribution centers. So with that in mind, uh, I held an offsite with our team after I had the opportunity to do my own assessment and shared with the leadership team back in early December, hey, this is what I'm seeing from a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats perspective, what we call a SWOT assessment. And, uh, and when I did that, the team gave me, with their depth, they gave me some really great points to uh, add or delete out of my personal assessment. And from that, we... Um, we, I published that 100-day assessment, and, and from that, during that offsite, we built a vision. And uh, this vision, uh, because I wasn't comfortable with the old vision that it was about six or seven years old, and it just needed to be freshened up. And, it, and to me, it didn't meet what I would define as a purpose of a vision. I wanted to set an aim point. You know, what are we looking for? I met with many stakeholders after I was publicly announced back in July from industry to retirees, just plain shoppers, to stakeholders within the building, service members themselves, uh, and the board of directors. And, and they all seem to have a different perspective on what DECA should be. So, so I knew it was important to define that vision. So, and we came up with it. I have since socialized it with these stakeholders and, and achieved, I think, their buy-in, but we'll see on that. But I published the vision in, in December, uh, and it went public just a few weeks ago. But uh, let me recite it to you, if you don't mind. To be the grocery provider of choice for our eligible patrons, delivering a vital benefit exclusively for our military community and their families. You know, it's almost like a private club, so to speak, in that you've got to earn your right to shop there. Mm -hmm. And you've got to offer your service to the nation to be able to, to enjoy this benefit. So I wanted to capture that, the exclusive aspect. But I also want to be the grocery store of choice. And, and with that comes a whole host of priorities. You know, you asked about that. But first and foremost, it has to be a safe place for them to shop. And I think we demonstrated with COVID that we can be safer than your normal grocery store. And it's a, so it's safe. Second of all, it's got to have what you want to buy. I ended up from that vision creating six lines of effort, strategic lines of effort that we are attacking now. The number one and where we get the most criticism from our customers is the supply chain. There are many ways to measure this, but in the end, it's all about are the products they desire to buy on the shelf or not. Uh, COVID has been very difficult on the supply chain for everybody. And uh, and for us, we went from about a 2 or 3 per percent out of stock okay. to really ranging somewhere around 10%. And often it was it was product that really needed to be on the shelf. So we're we're working hard on that, but that number one line of effort is getting improving our supply chain. The US supply chain for me as an as an old army logistician, supply chain is sort of my comfort zone. But frankly, the US supply chain is convoluted for DECA. We don't have a lot of control of some of the links inside that supply chain. I'm not used to that as an army logistician. And I'd like to fix that. Um, not sure how we'll be able to 
fix it as well as I'd like, but that's okay. Uh, we, we will improve it uh, either way, and hopefully we'll have more control and, or at least accountability for every link in the supply chain. So that was our first priority behind safety. The second one is, is getting e-commerce across the finish line. Uh, I, I was bragging back in November and December that I had doubled the number of stores we offer what we call click-to-go or curbside delivery or service, excuse me. Um, and we went from five stores to 10 stores. Now we're up to 11. But 11, you know, and it sounds great until I finished that that point. It's 11 now of 236. So it's nowhere near where it needs to be. So we're uh, we're doing what I call breaking glass there a bit. We are looking at really interesting commercial options to where we can leap ahead like every other retailer really has in, in the COVID environment. The grocery industry is now at about 11% of sales being through e-commerce. Back in May, I was reading an article written back in May of 2020 when we were already in COVID, where that was the target for 2025 of where the grocery industry would be. So we are we are accelerating at a dramatic speed in terms of how our patrons are buying their groceries. Uh, so we've got to we've got to deliver on that. That's a convenience and it's a safety factor. People don't want to go come in the store, and uh, so we we're working that as part of the e-commerce. And I've added delivery in there as well. I would like to at least be able to deliver on base if possible. And, uh, you know, like the grocery stores do today, uh, you know, pick your competitor, Kroger or Walmart. I mean, you can pick your delivery means. You you know, you want Uber Eats or if I could, I would love to be able to hire veterans-owned businesses to do that. But uh, but I, w- I do believe it'll be a third-party thing between the, the customer themselves and the delivery mode that they end up with. And uh, and I'm hoping there's opportunity there for veterans to have a business and meet the need of our patrons. So we're working that pretty hard under this e-commerce line of effort. Third priority is uh, what I call patron focus. I mean, we've got to deliver premier customer service. I mean, you, you know, the customer is king. And, and I felt like we're kind of there, but kind of not. And I just want to make sure we've set clear standards of how we treat our customers and what we do. And it comes back to, you know, that line of effort one and what products we offer. So we're working that pretty hard in that third line of effort. The fourth is demand creation. One of the reasons I was hired is that the commissary agency has had declining revenue really going all the way back to 2012. So we're in like eight years of declining revenue from a high of $6 billion in uh, 2012 to $4.5 billion in 2019. And we matched that and COVID actually contributed. The panic buying of March and April kind of kept us above. So we didn't decline in 2020. We were better by a half a percent. A little bit behind the grocery industry overall because there was much growth in the grocery industry in, in 2020. But uh, So we might have still lost a little share but we were on the plus side. Uh, but that said, we've got to find a better way to deliver on uh, on demand creation and deliver on our revenue. Like I said, every dollar we get in sales is a quarter that I feel we've delivered in benefit. So if we increase sales, we increase our benefit delivery and uh, and back to our vision. So, so that's another important priority. The final two lines of effort really facilities modernization. I just want to make sure our facilities are clean and modern. And uh, and really IT enabled, and then the last is our is our workforce. I mean, I want to take care of our people. I want to give them the skill sets they desire and need in order to operate in this refor- in this transformed commissary agency going he- to the future. So I want to make sure we are ahead of the ball in uh, in delivering good training and engaging with our employees. So that that's our priorities. You know, Bill, I'd like to jump ahead to something you mentioned earlier, and that's the Enterprise Business Solution Initiative. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us more about it, and how does it seek to modernize your entire resale retail business? You know, it is a great system, probably long overdue. We initiated this uh, way before my time, but back in 2016, we started deploying this new system. We're getting there. We have four increments of delivery. The for increment one is our merchandising suite, which is really how we deal with our suppliers. Uh, we're essentially fully deployed on that at this point. Increment two is how we replenish our stores. So how do we see ourselves at the store level? You know, is, is the product on the shelf or not? And uh, and that's we're at about 
70 percent deployed there, but we need to get that over the finish line. What I consider probably the more important increment is increment three, and that's our point of sale system. Getting that to the enterprise level to where we can then do e-commerce very easily, and uh, and we can do things like self checkout a lot easier, and, and just things our, our customers expect. We're about forty percent there, uh, you know, but not soon enough. Probably about a year or so out. I'd like to accelerate that, and, I, and I've got the team looking hard at how we can accelerate across the board. The fourth increment is really how we handle our distribution, uh, especially overseas, how, how we manage our warehouses. And um, we're just now, we, back in October, we did our first warehouse with the, this increment four, and we expect to see that over the next year to be fully implemented across our distribution centers. So we're getting there. Um, Part of getting there is getting EBS to the cloud. Right now, we are on-prem, so to speak, so we own our own servers, and that sounds great, um, but it's not so great. I mean, I, I in, my, in my past job working inside the Army, I was responsible for the Army's logistics IT and led our efforts to migrate to the cloud because there were so many benefits there. I, I became a believer in the cloud during that Time frame, uh, it creates much easier ways for us to modernize our IT, to protect it in terms of a cyber that, which was a bit counterintuitive to me, but it, it is safer on the cloud, and uh, and it just allows for us to host it in a cheaper but more effective way. So, uh, so I'm a big cloud advocate, and and part of getting EBS accelerated is going to be getting to the cloud and doing other aspects that we. Hadn't really uh, investigated very well before I got on board. Uh, you know, I want to pick my words carefully. Sure. We looked at it. We decided we had a policy obstacle. We couldn't get it over the finish line, but I'm talking about online payment. We have got, uh, you know, and I've told the Department of Defense leaders that I work for, we cannot be a 21st century retailer without online payment. It's just not feasible. And so uh, we're getting great support from the Pentagon on getting that over the finish line. So I think we'll get there on online payment. And if we get there with cloud and we get there with online payment, then we can really accelerate getting EBS out and doing things like e-commerce in a different, more effective way. You mentioned earlier, Bill, the, the collaboration with the exchanges. Um, how is it working? What more needs to be done? Yeah, you know, there was this huge push to consolidate uh, the commissaries with the three exchanges, you know, and they're three very different exchanges. You have AFES, the Army Air Force uh, Exchange System. So Army and Air Force already had combined. You had Nexcom, the Navy Exchange. AFES run by Tom Shul. A, uh, Nexcom run by Rear, Rear Admiral Retired Rob Bianchi, uh, who do had it as the uh, commissary director there for a couple of years. And then finally, uh, Cindy Whitman Lacey is the... She is the CEO of the Marine Corps Exchange. You know, a little bit smaller, but uh, but still very important. And, and those commissary, I mean, those exchanges are very different. And they w work with us. There was a study done by the DOD chief management officer that concluded there was a lot of promise in consolidating all four entities. Mm -hmm. This was before my time, but there was a lot of criticism of that study that the assumptions weren't very valid. Anyway, GAO took a hard look at it and didn't like the conclusions reached. And, and frankly, in this year's NDAA, this year's uh, authorization bill, Congress asked us to redo the study, which is now underway. And uh, we've got to deliver that sometime in the next few months that re-looks at consolidation. If I was a betting man, I don't think we will consolidate because it's just too darn expensive to do it. And the ROI is like 50 years. I mean, it's it will take forever to recover what it would what it would cost. I mean, just our IT system as an example. We're about three or four hundred million dollars deep in in our modernization of our IT, and I don't want to have to start over in some larger IT effort. But that said, there is still I think great low hanging fruit in how we partner with the exchanges. Rob, Tom, Cindy, and I talk at least weekly, about opportunities of how we could partner. We're working together now in this consolidation study to make sure we meet the needs of the Hill in, uh, in answering that question once and for all. But we also meet and discuss opportunities of partnership. We've created a joint buying alliance where if we're buying the same product, we might be able to strike a better deal if we if we join forces and uh, just you know from a volume buying perspective. And that's working pretty well. 
Uh, we may end up right now we're piloting beer and wine sales inside the commissaries. Every grocery chain gets a lot of sales out of beer and wine. And as a convenience to our patrons, I'd like to be able to offer it. We, we have it piloted in 12 stores, but we're doing that as a partnership with the exchanges. So basically, we're buying product from the exchanges and then we offer it inside the commissary to where if you want a red wine with that steak tonight, you know, what I don't want to do is have our customers say, well, I can't get the wine with the steak at the commissary. I'll, I'll go to Kroger, you know, and I, I want to make sure they they can deliver, you know, we can deliver the benefit and they can save money and maybe get their wine as a convenience or, you know, or beer with a burger. You know, turning to the future, um, what does the future operations look like for DECA? And I, what I'm getting out of here is smaller stores, more locations, fully automated stores, um, on-base coffee, food trucks kind of thing. Yeah. Things I would love to deliver on. I mean, back to the vision, you know, I want to be the grocery store of choice for every eligible patron. Well, those eligible patrons, they want these things. I mean, they weren't, for one, we're we're at 236 locations. I'm not sure how we got where we are, but that's where we are. It was actually over 420 commissaries when uh, DECA was formed in 1991. Now, it was a bigger Department of Defense, but I'm not sure how smart those decisions were made. There's really no dollars available to grow uh, the number of commissaries. So I'm, I'm like, so how do we deliver the benefit to our patrons when we've got limited locations? We have limited hours. I mean, we've got a lot of commissaries that aren't open seven days a week. I mean, what grocery store isn't open seven days a week? And I'm like, how do we get our stores open seven days a week to meet the needs of our patrons? And uh, I'd love to find better ways to doing that, but, but that adds to the cost of the operation and uh, not going to get any more taxpayer dollars, I don't think. So we're trying to figure all that out. I don't expect us to be able to have more locations. So I got to figure out how do we deliver at the locations we have? How do we get to that young service member? Is there ways to do that through e-commerce and delivery? Are we offering the right products for them? They're very health conscious. You know, we just rolled out this green thumb program where we have dietitian approved items on the shelf, and you and it's very easy to see it with the green thumb, and uh, and we're offering like meals that have already been prepared and the re- and you you know your shopping list is ready for you, and and that's just other ways I see us being able to deliver uh, moving into the future. Beer and wine, I mentioned that. You know, I'm not sure I'll get that over to finish line, but I'd like to offer. That I'd like to offer meals that are ready for them to just pick up, take home, and put in the oven, like you see at Kroger or Whole Foods. I think that convenience factor for our younger service members is huge. They have more buying power than my dad did as a staff sergeant in the 60s. And we've got to, you know, keep that in mind as we move forward. So how we deliver on the benefit for the evolving needs of our patrons is going to be really important moving forward. Our ability to partner with other vendors, Mm -hmm. we are constrained from doing that now with uh, just policy. And we don't want to be in competition with the exchanges. They they do that. And, and, you know, so when you see a Popeye's or Burger King on an installation, that's in partnership with the exchanges. And so that's a pretty clear line. Mm -hmm. Uh, that I'm not allowed to cross. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh, but I would love to find ways to partner with them and maybe d- at least deliver some of those conveniences, maybe under our roof, but as a partnership with the exchanges. And, you know, you can get that Starbucks coffee if you want it while you're grocery shopping, because that's what you see at a Whole Foods or a Kroger. And uh, so I don't, you know, the future, I think both the policymakers in the building and the uh, lawmakers on the Hill are both open to these ideas while we don't create unhealthy competition with the exchanges and uh, as we try to deliver on what our consumers desire. So so I do see a bright future there. Uh, you know, low-hanging fruit, not quite as high on the priority list as some of those other things I outlined earlier, but, but areas where I do see promise. This has been the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with Bill Moore, Director and Chief Executive Officer at the Defense Commissary Agency. Subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at Podcast One, iTunes, or on your favorite podcast app, and as always at businessofgovernment.org.